Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so excited for today. I cannot tell you, one of my absolute best friends ever sent me a message the other day. She's like, you know what? I think I would be actually a great um, person for your podcast. I was like, bitch, you would be amazing. And here's the reason why. Um, you have your own Wikipedia. So like, you're probably the most popular person I know. I already was thinking this morning, I was like, I'm going to need to start this by saying, you know, you call yourself like a great exaggerator. Yeah. So I imagine already in the intro that you're going to say like that I'm an Olympian. Oh, and fuck. These- I'm going to do you know, all like, the things. I am going to paint I'm this picture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pay you one like Olympic, like medal. She's an Olympic like medalist. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like it's somewhere in her bio. There was the word Olympic. There was winner. There was five times. So welcome <laughs> Leah Thorvalson, five time Olympic gold medal athlete. <laughs> five time let's just clarify guys what actually what christina says is five time olympic gold medalist what i actually am is five time little rock marathon oh, same five, thing. five time same thing. little rock marathon my bad i read that as five time olympic gold medalist okay well a little same bit thing. here a little bit there <laughs> Oh, I'm so excited to be on your podcast. I feel like I've joined the elite now. This is forget the Olympics. I'm on your podcast. <laughs> I decided your turn podcast, a gold medal, Olympic gold medal. I mean, you know, it's all the same. I've arrived. You have, you really have arrived at the ripe age of like, how old are you now? 45, 29, 29. Okay, good. 29. again. <laughs> 44. 29. 44. 44. You're going to be 29 again for the like, I don't know. What is that? Ever. The 16th time? Until yeah. I'm 70. And then maybe I'll decide that I'm 69. Um, well, you guys, if you are watching this on our YouTube channel, which by the way, yes, we now have a YouTube channel. It's at B Christina Liqueur. But I don't even know why we named it my real name because like probably you, who's one of my best friends, probably don't even know how to spell my last name because it's so fucking hard. So type in B Christina L and then chances are you'll find it. But if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll probably see that my girl Leah here today does not look anywhere close to 45. She's probably like one of the hottest friends that I have. And you're fit as fuck because you're an Olympic medalist. (laughs) And I get Botox. So I mean, there's that. (laughs) I'm not ashamed of it. Oh my gosh. No, we are all here. We are here. We are an unjudgmental um, podcast. We are here for all the fillers, all the Botox, anything that makes us feel amazing and allows us to decide it's our turn. But today we are talking about going all in on your dreams because there is not another human that I know who has literally gone all in for what she is so damn fucking passionate for and what brings her so much joy. And that's one of the reasons why I absolutely love you. So now that we've got clear that you're a five-time Little Rock <laughs> Marathon winner, you know, I say gold medalist for the Olympics, tell everyone who you are and why you're here, lovely. Oh, sure. So yeah, I'm Leah Thorvalson. I'm an athlete. Um, I, I, uh, I was formerly a competitive distance runner. Loved it so much. Like I was good at it too, but I loved it before I was great at it. And I think that's where I just poured so much passion into it. The things that like, yes, it's a grind. I won't say there was never a morning I woke up and didn't want to go for my run. I actually used to have these stress dreams. Like in the Arkansas summer, if I didn't get up early enough, I had to like wait until later in the day because it would just be too hot. And so I would take naps and I would have dreams that I didn't wake up in time to get my run in. So it's like, there's, I won't tell you those things aren't there, but generally I liked it. Like I didn't, I wasn't put off by, oh, you should be doing 70, 80 mile weeks. I loved the run. It was the only time I cleared my head fully. And over time, like through years and years of college training and track racing and everything, I just realized that I was really good at, I wasn't super fast, but I could, I mean, relatively a lot of people would say like, yeah, you're smoking fast, but compared to actual Olympic gold medal. Well, that's like what people tell me, like, I'm a good golfer. I'm like, yeah, compared to like you, I'm a good golfer, but compared to like real golfers, I'm not that fucking good. I don't know how we'd scale that. I think you're probably a better golfer than I was a runner, but I don't know. Oh, fuck. But- no, you won five times. I didn't want it. I didn't win as a professional one time. You've won the Little Rock Marathon five times. And that's just here in Little Rock. Like you're fucking good. You've got yourself in a Wikipedia. You guys, you can Google Leah, Leah Thorvald. She pops right up. Not just her own personal website like mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So 
I, I got pretty good at it. I also loved it. So I continued to do it. I think maybe I should have done a little bit less because my body broke down over time, which will happen to people. But I also know people who've been running literally like a marathon a month for years and they're like 70 years old and they're still kicking. And I was like, my body decided to kind of call it quits when I was in my mid thirties. I just started having some issues. First, it was a torn hamstring. Um, and then I wasn't the best patient with that. Like when I was recovering from my hamstring tear, I let the hamstring be, but when the doctor said like, okay, now you can get off the couch and you can go for walks. But mind you, I'm on crutches with one leg strapped up behind me. And I'm like, oh, well I would go for walks, not like out around the block, like just to the grocery store, which I also would do on my own with like a basket strapped around my neck. Cause I was single at the time. So I didn't have a boyfriend to be like, Hey, <laughs> we, oh, a fiance. I didn't have a fiance. I just we had engaged. just got engaged, but we're going to talk about that. Too, <laughs> we're going to talk about that. Very important for going all in on your point. Yeah. Um, so I would go for like miles long walks. Like I don't, I think I only did it once, but there was one day I walked to the yoga studio from the river trail and back, which was like 10 miles total on one leg. So I shouldn't have been surprised when that knee of my good leg gave out and had to have three surgeries. And that's how I ended up on the bike. And to make a very long story short in my recovery from all those surgeries. I took up cycling. I entered a competition on an online gaming platform called Zwift. If you haven't heard of it, look it up because it's really pretty cool. You control an avatar in a virtual world by riding on your bike in your house and you can ride with people from all over the world. Well, I entered this competition and the grand prize was a pro cycling contract. And with less than one year of cycling experience, I won the contract, which is sounds really amazing. And I don't say this to put myself down. Like I I'm strong for sure. I had an athlete's background. I'm an endure. I was a semi-professional endurance athlete. So I had the motor, but I would never win that competition today because it's gotten huge. Like when I did it, there was 1200 women competing this last year, there was over 125,000 competing. So without like they would vet the athletes now and you would have to have some sort of experience that says you're qualified to go race in the women's tour de France. But I just got to go. I mean, the women's tour de France wasn't exactly a thing. There was like a one day event, but basically the equivalent because people listening who aren't cyclists still will have heard of the tour de France. I went from racing with a field of never more than 15 women to <laughs> the equivalent of racing in the tour de France in a year. You shouldn't do that. I mean, I would trade it for nothing because, oh my gosh, have I had some amazing experiences in my life, but that's not the way to do it. It's just like, imagine if like the first year you ever played golf, somebody put you on the, whatever the equivalent of the women's PGA, is there a women's PGA tour? Yeah. LPGA. Yeah. So LPGA, just like out of the gate. Yeah. I mean, that's what kind of happened to me. Like I, I, I won the first three tournaments I ever played when I like, I took up golf one year and then the next year I won the first three tournaments I ever played and I got a college scholarship and I literally went to college and like never had hit out of the bunker. Like I, that was kind of like my situation, but I also think too, that like, how amazing is that, that we're both kind of talking about the random most random shit on the planet, but there's two of us sitting here on the screen talking about it. And like, we did not know each other. Like, yeah. When did we meet? Like four years ago, three years ago, uh, four years ago. Four. I mean, there's the time warp that is COVID. So it's hard <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in that, like, somewhere it's like years just disappear and meld into each other. But it was around that time. I, yeah. I remember you had one of my friends, Ashley Humps, oh, yeah. had posted one of your stories. I didn't know you were even in Arkansas. I just thought you were some like badass influencer chick and I'll write to anybody. I don't care. Like, I know I'm not going to get a response, but if something really speaks to me, or if I think something's super funny, I will straight up message whoever it is. And I don't care. Like they probably, I, I would never would have expected to hear back from you. And here's my testimony for you. When people like, when you always say, text me, I will respond. It's not a, like, she will. Cause I got a text <laughs> back and I was like, cool. This girl with like 20,000 followers took the time to respond to me. And then it was like, I don't know how long later I was like, Oh, you're in Conway. Like, I just figured you were, I don't know, LA, Italy. I don't know. I didn't figure you Damn, were. Bro, I love living in small town because like, I'm, you know, I, I do pretty well here. I I'm, I'm a, I'm a hack in LA. So I love living in small town. You and I can totally agree. Arkansas yeah. is like the fucking best. We, we literally have it made here. 
We do because when we're sick of it, we're, we can afford to get out because we're not, <laughs> exactly. paying, we're not paying quadruple the price for a house. Like, yeah. I think we both have homes that are paid off. It's because we live in Arkansas, guys. <laughs> exactly. Here, Arkansas, <laughs> like we are like we should really do a podcast for Arkansas, like come to Arkansas.com. I actually sit on that board Please, and I no, tell people no, because then it'll drive out the price. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck it. It's it's horrible <laughs> anyway. here. It's rednecks, marry your sister type of shit. It like it's it no is. good over Everybody's here. inbred. Yeah. Yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> stay away, stay away. And it's not absolutely gorgeous and cheap. So stay away. But, um but, you know, I think it's something that I really resonated with you from the beginning. Obviously, like you had the athletic background, which you and I kind of told again, and I don't even consider myself really like an athlete. I consider myself like kind of a golfer, like, you know, whatever. But the mindset of just being like that person who literally has a Guinness book, and this isn't an exaggeration. Leah literally has a Guinness book of world records for the f- fastest 5k. Keep in mind on fucking crutches folks <laughs> okay but uh, you're not exaggerating but it is i did that but it's not actually official what? i looked up because i looked up when i was doing my crutch walks i was like i wonder what the fastest 5k someone's ever done on crutches is so i looked it up and it was like 59 minutes or something i was like i can do that so I found a 5k and i went and i did it which it was i i honestly felt a little bit bad because it's like i mean i didn't it, for being on crutches, I had to hustle. Like I wasn't moving fast, but I, I was working to make sure I beat that time. So I was like passing people walking. And it's just like, I think it's demoralizing when someone on crutches comes flying by you in the last couple hundred meters of a 5k. But so I went to submit, like I, I broke the record by, I think, I don't know, two minutes or something. And I went to submit all this stuff. And they were like, you need to have the witnesses, two witnesses. You need to have record of your time. Well, you also, I should have looked this up ahead of time. You had to have the whole thing videoed from start to finish. And I hadn't done it. And I was just like, I don't care enough to do it again. Like, I don't need my name imprinted. I know that I broke it. Maybe I I thought maybe one day I'll do it again. But I mean, this is how many years later I haven't gone back and done it. And I think now that I don't have to be on crutches, like kind of lost the, sure, I could strap one leg up and go do it again, but <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like, care. What happened? Nothing. I just want the record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not injured. This is a Guinness attempt, folks. Guy behind me with like a, on a moto with a camera. Yeah, maybe, maybe one day. No, I love it. But I think the whole point of that is the fact that like you literally have had this mentality. Like, do you think it's kind of been like your whole life? You are literally like the epitome of the person who just chases so much happiness and so much joy. And the thing that you truly want, you know, at the end of the day, I always tell everyone, I don't care how much money you make. If you're miserable in doing it, 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 it's just not worth it. And you have said things so, so well, it's like, you know, your wealth has really come from the life that you've lived. And the fact that you have literally put your whole entire life into things that just make you so fucking happy. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I actually had this conversation very recently because I I think, I don't think it was a realistic thing, but I was talking with a former employer and someone in the, in our vicinity had said, oh, they want to hire you back. And I was like, well, it would take them telling me I don't have to wear heels. I don't have to wear hose and $125,000, which I know some people would be like, that's not even that much money, but it's almost double what I make right now. And he said, well, let's talk. And when he left, I, I looked at my fiance. I said, do you think he's serious about that? And, and he's like, I don't know, talk to him. And I was like, I don't think they can actually afford to pay me that. And I said, you know what? I don't know if I would take it because when I think about in a day, what stresses me, like, I don't make a lot of money, but I never, when I lose sleep at night, it's not because I need more money. It's because I need more time. It's because I need more something that's just, you know, I need to complete this and then I'll feel more happiness, but it's, it's it right now. And I've been in a place where it is about money. So I get that money is important. I won't tell you it's not important, but there's a crossover, right? Where what you need and what you want, where the want for joy and the want for time and the want for peace in your life overtakes the want and need for finances. So that, and that's where I think I've 
landed at a really good balance where I'd love to make more money, but I don't need to, you know what I mean? Do you so think it like, becomes easier to make more money when you don't need it? Hmm. That's an interesting, interesting. I don't know. I, th- I, I think probably so. I don't know if in my career, because currently I'm not, I'm not my own boss. I think if you're your own boss, absolutely 100% because the stress goes away. So for me right now, I mean, what it would take for me to make more money is somebody else in control to give me a raise, <laughs> Yeah. but, but, um, but yeah, I think it takes the stress away. Um, like for example, you know, I've, I've coached in the past and I coached, I'm, I, I'm open to coaching on the side, but if somebody were to come to me, you know, when I was in a place where I just really needed money and say, well, I'll pay you a hundred dollars a month to coach. Eh, maybe do I want to give up more time to make that little money, but I would do it because I needed that hundred dollars a month. Well, now I don't need that hundred dollars a month. So now if someone were to come to me, I'd be like, I'll do it for $500 a month, which I know you would still say is grossly underpaid, but for, for runners, that would be a solid chunk of change. Like I had a guy when I was unemployed recently. Oh, so someone's going to hear this podcast and be like, oh my God, I can train with literally a five-time marathon champion, uh, Olympic gold medal trial, fastest 5k in the world for only $500 a month. Bitch, you need hey. to up that price because someone is going to be like, is, was that chick serious? Is she like open to taking me? <laughs> I mean, I know it's going to make you mad, but yeah, for $500 a month, I will, because I enjoy it. Yes. Exactly. Like I wouldn't enjoy it at scale, but I don't think there's going to be as many people as you think, but there might be two. And suddenly I'm making an extra grand a month and I'm enjoying it because it's Amen. So really for me. I a hundred percent agree with that part. I think you need to get paid very well for your skills, but I also think you have to enjoy it. I mean, at the end of the day, there's so many other things that I could be doing that would make me more money, but the answer is fucking a hard no. And you and I totally agree with this. And this is the reason why we're doing this podcast is because like, I could be doing a ton of other things that are making money, but I am so adamant that it has to bring you joy. You have to be in alignment. Well, even like I just was listening to your, I think it's your latest pod. I don't know. Sometimes my podcast real just plays podcasts and I never know for sure if it's the, but where you're talking about going to here let me plug your business for you going (laughs) to just to just doing one-on-one coaching. Yeah. That's what gives you the most joy. And you could do a lot more big events and potentially rake in a bunch more money, but what you feel that is the biggest service to your clients, which is what gives you the joy. You get joy from helping other people. 100% more than you get joy from making seven figures. A hundred percent. There's no doubt in my mind, but I also think too, that like the more in alignment that you are with what you're supposed to be doing, the better opportunities you have to make more money. And even you say that, yes, you work for someone else. Yes. You work for a corporation, but also too, can we think about what's happened in your life over the last year? You are now making more money because you're in alignment with what you're supposed to do. Right. And I, I, even though like, yes, I'm, I'm an employee of a corporation. So to tie, to tie back in for people who don't know, I talked about my journey to cycling and winning this competition on a platform called Zwift, which, you know, you and I are both spiritual people and, and believe I I don't, I don't, well, I I was going to say, I don't believe that everything is for a reason, but a lot of things are for a reason. Maybe I do. I don't know. Point being, I now work for Zwift. So not only did I get to win this competition and go and travel the world and ride my bike for a living, but I also met the people at this company who are now like, some of them are very close friends. And it's just like, I mean, I I don't think too many people on this call will have had a job that they were let go, laid off, whatever. I was laid off and I was in tears for 10 hours straight, not because of the stress of the finances, but because I felt like where I was, was so in alignment with who I am and what I wanted to do that having to even consider going to find that same joy in another occupation broke me. Like, I, I mean, I got through it. I'm fine. I'm, I'm actually back at Zwift. <laughs> so, and you're so much better. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so, I'm so good. Yeah. But, um, 
but I think it's just like that to me really spoke to, I knew I would, well, I didn't ever think about what would it feel like if I got laid off? I didn't see it coming. None of us saw it coming. It was a massive layoff that affected like 200 people. And it hit me harder, like punch in like literally, I mean, you saw me the next day and you were like, you look thin. And I mean, like I literally dehydrated myself crying. <laughs> it was just, it was awful, but it's just like, that tells me that I was, I was where I needed to be. I was where I was meant to be. And it's where I've found my way back to. Yes. And I feel like you have had that happen so many times in your life. Do you feel like that that's true? Yes. Yeah. yeah, Yes. A hundred percent. And sometimes it's an easy, you know, I know you'll get to the whole decision thing, but sometimes it's been an easy decision. Sometimes it's been a hard decision and sometimes it hasn't been a decision at all as with the whole thing with the layoffs from Zwift. But I feel like when I come to those impasses now, it's not, you. I don't sit around and wait for God or wait for the universe or wait for something to happen. That'll be okay. But I do tend to feel a calm and know that it will be okay because it always is. It always is right. Like sometimes easier than others, but it's just like, you know, um, I'm trying to think of what was the first time. I don't I'm know sure if it's when, it's when you broke your leg or when you're, when I tore my hamstring, yeah. because at that point, you know, my identity was wrapped up in being a runner. Like everyone knew me as a runner. I knew myself as a runner. I, I had left, I had made a choice to leave a job that paid actually that's still the in for, it was sales. So it wasn't consistent, but the one year was to date the highest yearly salary I've ever made. And I walked away from it to go work at a running store so that I could have a more flexible schedule so that I could focus on running. And that's how invested I was in running. And then when I tore my hamstring, it's like, okay, you're going to be on a couch for a week. You're going to be on crutches for 12 weeks. There's no guarantee you'll ever get back to the level of runner that you were. Um, I didn't, I didn't honestly even know how I would be okay. Like if I don't have this, what do I have? Because I'm working an hourly paying job. So I can't, I can pour into a career, but it feels like, what am I doing? Um, I didn't have a relationship, so I didn't have that to pour into. Like I had a ton of friendships, but it was just like, I felt like I was going to be so alone and so broken, but I kind of was faced also with no choice. Like I had to have this surgery. Right. And I tell you, I was filled with so much peace when it happened that I can't explain any other way than God. I can't like, because I just, I mean, and maybe that's just, you know, somebody who's the, what is it? The devil's advocate would say like, oh, you just, you, you had to be, cause you had no choice. Well, I guess, I mean, I, I didn't, but I could have felt sorry for myself. I could have been super depressed. And it was like, I just, I just kind of flowed with it. Yeah. I think that that is so helpful because I know that there's a person on the couch right now, hypothetically speaking, there's a person on the couch right now who doesn't have that piece. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. A hundred percent. And I had, I had a roommate at the time and he also worked in the same running store that I did. And he was, you know, he was an athlete and, and when he wasn't working though, he was playing video games a lot. Anyway, he came home one day and had the nerve as I'm laying on the couch to be like, he was kind of an Eeyore. I don't think he'll ever listen to this podcast or I'd feel bad, but sorry, Ryan, if you've happened to find your way to this podcast, I'm definitely talking about you. <laughs> he was like, I was like, how's your day? As I'm laying there, like, I can't do crap, right? How's your day? Oh, well, I went for a run and I guess now I'm going to go for a bike ride. I'm like, oh, poor you. Know what I did today? I laid on this couch, <laughs> but it's all right. It's fine. I'm like, how am I happier than you right now? <laughs> you get to do all the things I want to do. Isn't and, that yeah. so interesting though? Because when I always talk about, you know, you know, I talk about the decision, faith and action and, and just to kind of be very transparent, Leah has been to one of my retreats before. So I guess I consider her like a former client or whatever, yeah, but hundred percent, hundred percent. That's where we really first connected. Like we were connected obviously before that, but like really that's when we got to know each other, but like the decision, faith and action st part, like the faith part, I always tell people like you can do life without the faith part. Like you can do it. Like tons of people have a lot of success or whatever. But to me, the faith part is the part about like the peace, the being okay, the enjoying the experience. Like 
to me, that is the most like crucial part because you being on that couch, there's been a ton of people have been on that couch and been fucking miserable to their core, not thinking that like it was going to be okay. Like your faith part allowed that experience, even though it was hard, it sucked. We all have those moments, but like, it was like that, that knowing. Yeah. And there's almost always in every hard situation situation. I say almost because I know someone may hear this and be like, oh, my grandfather passed away of cancer and was miserable the whole time. Find the silver lining in that. Like not always, but almost not, when you're not talking about death of, of close people to you, when you're talking about like a difficult circumstance in your own life, there's almost always a silver lining. And that's one thing that I think I'm good at is like, I'll find that motherfucker. <laughs> like, yeah, you will. will find it. I will find the silver lining. And even then I just remember thinking like, dang, I, I didn't realize how much like one-on-one -on -one time I hadn't spent with friends, how much time I hadn't spent reading books, how much time I hadn't spent just meditating. Like, I mean, I didn't sit in like the pose and like the ohm, but just, you know, like Meditation yeah. really at its core is just sitting in silence and sitting in your space and just being, I didn't do a lot of that until I had to. And so it's like, you know, breathe in, breathe out, like just gratitude. You talk a lot about living in gratitude, gratitude for time that I would have been out training. I would have been out doing an actual yoga class. I would have been out doing all these things that were great. I mean, there was nothing wrong with what I was doing but I just didn't often take the pause to spend time with people or spend time with myself just being. And that was the silver lining in that instance, you know, was just. What being... did you get out of that though? Like what, like what, can you clearly see that like God basically like gave you that time for a reason? That, and, and, and Andy, my fiance would hear this and say like, you are still terrible at that. But I think <laughs> being a little bit okay with like when for whatever reason whether it's like a, a minor injury that I have to take time off or I'm traveling and I can't take my bike like it sounds so stupid to someone maybe who's not to you I'm sure but someone who's not a professional athlete or a competitive athlete to say like it's very hard for me to take days off like because as, as much as I love it I'm also obsessed and there's it's 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 very I think for any elite athlete, it's, it's borderline between where your obsession is good and commitment wise. And then where it becomes obsessive and, and you can, you know, develop some unhealthy habits and all kinds of shapes and forms. And that's five other podcasts, but, but I think being at least a little bit more okay with like, okay, this is, this is really going to be fine. Like you've taken 12 weeks off and come back from it, which was a good thing I learned that because that was the first of what ended up being four surgeries in the next three years. I spent one quarter of my life on crutches in those three years. Wow. Yeah. It was a lot of crutches. <laughs> I, got, <laughs> I mean, my crutches, I've got some pimped out crutches. One pair has like, we were in Vail. I had, I went to Vail to have a surgery because that's how complex this one was. I was like, they're like, you have to go to this guy here. Cause he's the best. So it's covered in stickers. Like people cover their ski travel boxes and stuff. My crutches are covered in those. They have drink holders on them. Like one has a horn, one pair has a horn on it. Like you're going to live on those things. They're going to become, a, if they have to be a part of me, by God, they're going to be a fun part of me. Like, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a place to hold my coffee on here. Like, of course there is. Yeah. There's a pouch. There's a pouch for my phone on here because I can't hold those things and operate my crutches. So let me figure out how can I engineer these crutches? <laughs> Do you know what? That is one of the things about you that I want people to like, obviously, like I, I know everyone's falling in love with you just because you're like, you can't, <laughs> you can't not fall in love with Leah. Like everyone knows Leah because she is just like such a fucking great time. And you know, you're so positive, just kind of like the way that you're coming off. But like, how do you be that like what do you think one of like I I think it's like one of your your skills is the fact that when you are somewhere you are somewhere like when you and I are having our signature drink you guys feel free to use it it's um rosé and you add ice it's our <laughs> signature drink <laughs> rosé on the rocks baby rosé on the rocks <laughs> but like you have so much fun with everything that you're doing you choose joy over everything I choose joy and I think I think part of what, because I've been told that, so this isn't me being like, gosh, I'm fun to be around. No, you I've are just, fucking fun to be around. <laughs> but I mean, I've just been, and I just remember even when I was running, people would be like, 
you look like you're having so much fun. Like in the middle of a marathon, you'll be smiling at people. And I'm just like, because God, how, how blessed am I? You know, but it's like, it's not like I just walk around all the time. Like, Oh, I'm, I'm so blessed. But I just, I really enjoy life. And I think, I think people feel that. And I just, there's certain people who make other people feel seen. And I think I have that not because I try to have that just because other people tell me that I make them feel that way. So that's not me, you know, again, being like, well, well, I'm just, I've just been told that. And I think some of that comes from actually, whenever I say like, I'm insecure, people are like, oh, bullshit. I'm like, really though? It's like, and I think when you, sorry, I don't know how to mute that. Um, I think when you, (laughs) ah, stop. I'm going to have to text these. I've got a text thread blowing up my computer right now, guys. I'm sorry. Um, and I don't even have my phone here to mute it, but I think if you're, if you have an insecurity or if you've ever been in a place, like I, I hate walking into an event or a restaurant, like alone, like where I don't know anyone or where I have to, I think a lot of people will resonate with this. You ever like go into a restaurant and everybody you know is already there. <laughs> this just happened when we were celebrating my engagement, but that's a small restaurant I knew right where you were. So it wasn't a big deal, but it's like, you have anxiety over people watching you look for who you're looking for. Like who cares? Nobody there cares. All they care about is like getting to their table and getting their drinks. But it's like, I get anxiety over that. And if it's like a party and I don't, and maybe I know one person and you walk in and it's just like, oh my God, nobody cares. Nobody's, nobody's focused on me, but in my mind, I'm so anxious. So I think- when you have that sort of anxiety or that sort of insecurity, you naturally want to make sure nobody else feels that. Like if you've ever felt people who feel isolated or people who feel lonely or people who feel that sort of anxiety, never want other people around them to feel that way. So it's just like, if I go into a place, you know, and it's like, I mean, not saying if I'm in a conversation with a group of people that I really know, when I see a sad sack in the corner, I'm going to lead the people I'm talking to. Well, no, but it's just like, I think if I'm in a room and I'm alone and someone else is alone, like I'm probably going to find my way. If I don't first find my way to someone I know to that person, because it's just like, I don't want to be here by myself. They don't want to be here by themselves. And I think that's just kind of a like, I want, I want everybody laughing. I want everybody having a good time. I'm probably not great at like, I don't know if I'm the greatest person when somebody's like super, super sad. Cause I can be there for it, but I'm like, I probably should just keep my mouth shut because my innate like desire to make somebody laugh isn't appropriate right now. And I don't like, I don't know how I'm not great at that but I'm recognize it. So at least I can be quiet. (laughs) But you are the person to make, like, I think that that's actually a a really, like, I never really thought about it like that. It's like, you have felt that way. So you never want another human to feel that way. And I think that that's very similar to the way that I feel in the fact that like, you know, for such a big portion of my life, I never felt worthy. I never felt like enough. I never felt like I had that purpose. And so now I think I'm just like, you know, I, I hopefully I'm not completely other side of the pendulum, but I am just, I'm so passionate about it now because I never want anyone to feel like that again. So like, that's a really, yeah, I didn't realize that. Makes you such a great coach. That's what makes you so, because it's, because it it's, it's so obvious to see that you're, you're so real, you're not fake. And you can tell, even if you don't know where that comes from, you can tell that you really truly want people to succeed because sadly, and I haven't experienced this, but I just, maybe I've experienced it a bit in like the, in the athletic side, not in, in the coaching business that you're in, but there are coaches out there who think they want to help, but they really don't. They really want, not that they don't realize they want other people to fail, but when other people succeed, it makes them feel like a failure. Mm-hmm. When other people succeed, you truly feel like you have succeeded. Oh, and fuck, you mentioned 100%. on your podcast too, when you're just like, I might not make seven figures, but my clients might. And yeah. I think, I think there's coaches out there who that would bother. How am I able to coach this person to do it, but I can't do it myself. And that's not a good coach. A good yeah. coach is the person that wants the person to succeed. Even if that means beating you, mm-hmm. even if that means becoming what you have not become, not because you couldn't, but because you chose rather than making seven figures, you would rather make six figures, which is still a lot of money and be happy doing it and, and, and be successful doing it and have clients who then go on and make their seven figure business, then you've been successful. And that gives you joy. Yeah. 
Thank you for saying that because it's so true. And that's exactly what you do when you are being like the person who you almost give people. And I want really people to hear this. Like you give people so much permission to chase their dreams. Like you give people so much, like I could cry about it because that's you. Like you are the person who just goes all in on choosing the things that bring you joy. You go all in on choosing the dream. Like you really do like, yes, you make $70,000 a year or whatever it is, but like you literally have such a wealthy life because you do fun. Like, I actually feel like, yes, I make good money, but I have that same life. Like you and I, we fucking choose joy. And I guarantee you there is people who would rather have the way that I show up and the way that you show up for their lives than the money. So yes, we talk about the money all the time because, you know, money is a part of it. There's no doubt. I mean, if you're scrimping and you can't like, it's harder to choose joy, but I think people get so confused about the money is how you choose the joy and you choose the joy even before the money. And I guarantee fucking you, I do the exact same thing. I choose the fun. I choose the, the enlightenment. I choose like You know, you and I can have just as much fun going for a free walk as we can going for a bougie glass of wine or whatever it is. Well, and I think the thing is you've made a lot of money and with that money, you pour it back into developing yourself further. You pour it into your clients. You pour it into taking big ass trips that, I mean, some definitely you could say extravagant. I know for sure. No, for it's, sure. I like it. I, I spend that. my money on, on travel for sure. But the thing is you work your ass off to get there. And then, so dang it, you're going to enjoy every second of that trip. Even if you're in Mexico and it rains the whole time, you're going to think, sit there and think about how blessed you are to be there. And I think there's some people that they chase the money and they chase the money and then they get the money and they're like, why am I still not happy? Mm-hmm. And I mean, I've, I've experienced some of that. Like, I mean, I remember when I ran what at the time was my fastest marathon ever. And I was like, whoa, like it was a seven minute best. It was like my first time under two hours and 40 minutes, which if, I mean, for an average runner to hear that, you're like, that's effing fast. Like it is, couldn't do it anymore. I wish I could. <laughs> but, you know, the first time it happened, I remember like I was ele- like at cloud nine, right? Like, oh, think of the doors. This is open for me. I'm going to get invitations to so many marathons. Now I'm going to get this, that, the other thing, I'm going to be able to win a bit of money because I was making not squat at that time. So it was like, I'll be able to go to races and make a couple thousand dollars by winning. But that day in my hotel room, I was like, oh shit, well now what? Like now what? Like I didn't even know that breaking 240 was a goal because I was so, I was like five minutes from it. Suddenly I just did it by two minutes. What do I do now? And I think a lot of people, I mean, for me, it was like, okay, well, I just need to, let's take a minute and sit in this and enjoy it. And then we'll look for the next goal. But I think a lot of people, it's like, they think that if you just have a ton of money, then, then the happiness comes and it can, if you know what, if you have a plan for the money and maybe that's okay, maybe that plan is I want to invest it so that my kids can go to college and be debt free. Well, then you should have some sort of joy, some sort of relaxation and knowing like you have now you've procured that fund for your children. So sit and enjoy it and then figure out the now what, but I think some, it's just like, well, it's gotta be more money. And you spend so much time earning the money, focusing on the money that then you get the money and you're still not happy. And you don't know why. And you hear like actual famous people talk about this all the time oh, that, gosh. that the people think it's going to fix everything. And it doesn't, well, of course it doesn't fix everything. I mean, yeah, it can buy you, have to learn- can buy you a lot of stuff, but you have to know what you, you have to have a purpose for that money or else you can have all the money in the world. And it's just, it's, it's why a lot of like, I've got a former teammate who is, she's in a relationship now with a, and I don't, I'd be surprised if either of them ever listens to this podcast either, but you know, Tiffany Brown, this well, podcast. we got a lot of people listening, Ryan, they do. this chick, Maybe they do. I hope they do. I don't, well, I just, I can't see, you never know, Tiff Cromwell, but Terry Bodas, if you're listening to this, I'm talking about you guys, Woo-hoo. but I mean, everybody, I think a lot of people, if they don't know Tiff, they, which is a good chance they do, but well, Terry Bodas, like huge F1 driver, oh, like, okay. I don't know what kind of money he makes, but they are as a couple rich, 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 rich. And every time you look on their socials, they're in another country, they're skiing, they're snowboarding, they're putting on events. They, he, he rides in his off season. So they do these gravel events. Like they've started a, um, a gin company. They're start like, they're starting this like vacation companies from Finland and Finland. Like that's like, 
yeah, I make a lot of money and I'm going to live it. But there's some people who it's like, I guess I buy a bigger house. I guess I buy another car. I guess I go do some drugs because they're chasing this happiness. It's like, you have to find something else that gives you joy. Even if you need money to get those things, there's gotta be, there's gotta be a joy or else it's just this never ending chasing your tail for what? Do you think that that happens along the way? Like, do you think that you've trained yourself to find that happiness along the way? Because I think that that is what I have done since I became conscious of going, well, fuck, that wasn't what it was supposed to be. So I got to change now. And I think that I think I've created because, you know, I always talk about like you, 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 you train no matter what period. Like it's happening period because you've created the habit to do it when you're tired, when you're upset, when you're, you know, when the weather's good, when the weather's bad, you, because you've created a habit. I think the same thing happens with the joy and the gratitude. Like, of course there's days where I'm not happy or grateful, but like I've trained myself to do it, that I can do it along the journey. So like the, the, the big end thing isn't really the thing because it's always been the small things along the journey. Yeah. You have to enjoy the journey because it's not, there's not, and that's just like, there isn't an end to it. Like people no. who like, it's think about like with a diet is just an example. I think a lot of people Everyone can, resonate with. everybody has a goal weight and they want to get to it. Well, how many people, why do people yo-yo on diets? Because they, they feel like, they, I worked so hard to get here. And I'm not saying like, if you're on a diet, of course it's okay to drink the wine, eat the cake. I mean, I probably would say to do it more often than people would think they should, but people who have been like a super, super strict diet. And then they get there and it's like, but they don't want to keep putting in the work. Like guys, it doesn't work that way. Like, can you back, can you go super, if you're, if you have to lose, if you need, actually need like for health reasons to lose a bunch of weight, like, can you lose that weight and then get healthy and then maybe back off of it. Yeah. But you're going to have to work. You're going to have to keep working. So if you hate what you're doing, you have to change something because it's not sustainable over time to wake up every day and keep doing something you hate. Mm -hmm. Just, it just, it, I mean, I guess it's probably sustainable, but I don't know that it would be sustainable without being a miserable person. <laughs> yeah. And that's the part that like, I think is just so unbelievably important. And that's kind of like the whole point of today's podcast. It's like, you know, Leah makes good money, doesn't make amazing money, but you have one of the best lives because you just yeah. truly choose joy. You truly choose happiness. You truly like go all in on your dreams. And like now we've got something even bigger to fucking celebrate because Leah has just recently got engaged. And <laughs> the day that she messaged me, she's like, she sends me a photo of her cutting <laughs> onions and she's like, Hey, like Probably. my onions. What did you say? I said, oh, just chopping garlic. No big just deal. chopping garlic or onions or whatever it was. Just Oh, just over here chopping garlic. So I was like dying because I saw the ring or whatever. And that was the very first thing I said to you because I know Leah, like Leah just is a person who chooses joy and she is the person who's going to chase the dreams and do all the things. And like, you know, like, or Le Leah's favorite place is Spain because that's where she was writing and all the things. And I was like, so where are you going to get married? And you said Spain. And I was like, okay, okay cool. Can I book my ticket now? <laughs> like totally invited <laughs> my fucking self. I don't know if they're eloping, but like, I'm fucking going to come. Yeah. We're not actually going to get married in Spain because Andy's parents. Fuck? I wanted so to go. Probably, yeah. Well, you'll definitely be invited to wherever the wedding is, but uh, because of Andy's family, it's probably going to be somewhere in Arkansas. You can come to the honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I'll fucking roll up. You know me. And because we've been through this, I say yes to all fun things. If it's yes. fun, I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I do think that it's helpful to kind of talk about the engagement because, and talk about your relationship really too, because again, I, I do think that that is you kind of going all in on your dreams. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So the guy I'm engaged to now, his name is Andy. He's amazing. We love him. Um, we've been dating for seven and a half years and he, he comes from a very conservative background and, you know, has always said like, he wouldn't live with me unless we were married, which was not a problem for me in the beginning and really wasn't a problem. It wasn't a problem, except that I'm just like, if this is for, if this is for life, I'm okay being 44 and living in two separate houses. Financially, it's stupid, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> Cause again, choosing joy, not, and it's not all about the money, but, um, but I was just like, but if we're going to be together, like, are we going to be 60, 70 and still like, 
I'm never, I was never going to give him an ultimatum. Well, I kind of did one time, but I never, I didn't, I wasn't giving him an ultimatum to, and get to propose. I, I didn't, I wouldn't have even wanted a proposal that came out of an ultimatum, but I was just like, I want to share a home. I want to build a home with you. And I understand that because of your beliefs, that can't happen unless we're married. So I guess I'm telling you that I need to know that we're planning to get married or that you're going to change, you know, how do you, how, it was a very difficult thing because I don't want to argue with someone about their beliefs. And part of me thought like, well, maybe he just doesn't want to set this example because he's got two kids who are both grown and now both married. But I thought maybe, maybe he would be okay with it as long as, you know, once his youngest is married and has moved out, then he won't worry about setting the example. It's okay to live together. And, but it didn't change. He, his youngest got married, moved out, and that didn't change. And I'd had a conversation with him one time when I said, somebody had told me to tell him he was standing in the way of me meeting my husband. And I actually said it to him. And I was like, oh, I'm so proud of myself. But then I went and drank like an entire bottle of wine and got wasted and cried. And like, I wasn't able to follow through with the breakup because it didn't make me happy. And it's just like, I won't say like, no relationship is perfect and everything takes work. But literally I was just like, in the seven and a half years we've been together, I can count the times we've actually got into an argument on one hand. And I can't even, I can only think of, I can only think of two right now that are anything other than, I'm not saying we've never disagreed, but it's just like at my age, at our age, I know I'm older, but at our ages, not by much, if, if, if you were to start dating somebody and this sounds pessimistic and I don't mean it to, but it's just like, even when I was younger, I had experience where it's just like, you're waiting for the other shoe to drop when you meet somebody great, right? Like either they have, you have no common interest, which I think is good to have your own interest as well. But if you have no common interest, what do you, so, okay, that's an obvious deal breaker. You're just not physically attracted to them. I realize looks aren't everything, but you have to be attracted to the person at least a little bit. Um, um, for sure. Fingers crossed you're fun. sleeping with them. So yeah, <laughs> so we would really appreciate that part. Right. And that, and those are minor things, but then it's like, the things you don't see right away. Like I've dated people in the past who it's like, great person. Like, oh, who's this guy? Like, where'd you meet him? He's amazing. But when he drinks, mm. not even that they're abusive, but they turn into an asshole or somebody that just like, I don't, I don't, I don't need alcohol in my life, but I like to have a glass of wine. I like to have a few drinks. And on a rare occasion, I maybe like to have one glass too many, like rare. But when I'm doing that, I don't want a guy who's going to, because I get silly. I'm a happy, like if I'm drunk, I'm a happy drunk. I'm not, I don't get mad. I don't get, I don't, I don't drink typically other than the time when Andy and I kind of temporarily broke up and I, I did have a bottle <laughs> of wine. But the reason is like, as much as you say like, oh, I'm this happy, joyous person, my, my emotions and my personality are amplified when I have alcohol. So it's like, I don't drink when I'm sad because I'm going to be more sad or I'm going to pass out and then wake up and feel more sad. So I don't, you know, it's like just talking about relationships, those kind of things, or somebody could have, you know, terrible kids. I hate to say that, but they could have terrible kids, or maybe they have great kids, but they have a psychotic ex, or maybe they have a great ex. And like, you're constantly worried they're going to get back together. And how can you really be not for that when you think a family should be together? But all those things, I was just like, I don't, Andy's kids are wonderful. Their mother is, is no longer with us, which isn't a good thing, but I'm just saying, if you're just looking at the perspective of, I don't have an X in the picture. So it's just like things that could be a complication, like literally our one thing, like our one issue is that I want to share a home and he's not willing to share a home if we're not married. And, you know, I know when we met, I think it was right after yeah, it was. So it was when we really, I mean, we met, I think in 2018 or 19, like social media wise, 2018. Yeah. But it was the end of 2019 when I had this temporary breakup. And then it was like not long after that we were at the retreat. And I know people are just like, well, you're settling. Cause I was, I told Andy, I was like, we need to try to work this out. I don't know if you need counseling or I don't know if what, but I don't, I don't want to not be with you when this is our only thing. Like there, you don't have I mean, people would say that fact that he likes Tucker Carlson is a red flag, but I'm saying that you don't, you don't for me, hey, you don't a lot of my viewers love Tucker. Don't get me wrong. Don't dog my dad. I mean, uh, well, for a while, like, yeah, yeah. I just, I just, hey, I you're the one who that. says on the intake form, let's not get into politics. I was really going to open yeah. the, open the podcast with, okay, who'd you vote for? Vote for Biden. <laughs> and you no, know, I just, I find any more, like I just, 
he he likes to watch Tucker and I'll sit there to spend time with him, but I just tune out. And but I do the same thing if it was CNN. Like I just find news on both sides to be so whiny. I find them so all they do is complain about the other side. So anyway, but he didn't have didn't have any red flags, you know, like deal breaker red flags, but we're gonna leave this relationship because of this thing. And so I was just, it was like, well, have you talked to him again? You know, because I was just like, I'm just gonna give him some time. But I said, but the next time the next time I talk to him, it is, he already knows where I stand. So the next time I talk to him is when I leave him. So I'm not opening that because then otherwise it becomes void of any, you know, there's, there's, there's no, if you, if you say this thing twice, but go back on it, then why are you even saying it? It becomes hollow words. Right. So it's just like, I'm not going to bring the topic up again, unless I'm ready to to do something different. Yeah. And I wasn't, I knew I wasn't ready to walk away. And I kept, I mean, like I was on a trip last summer and talking to my mom in the airport. And I was like, I'm trying to figure out how and when I'm going to break up with Andy. And I was like, I love him, but I just, I don't want to be in living in two separate homes when we're 70 years old. I'm not okay with it. And he's not okay. He doesn't know if he ever wants to be married again. I can't, I don't want a proposal out of, out of force. So where do I go with it? And really I mean, for the last three years, that's where I thought this was going. I never saw a proposal coming. I was just like, we're going to be together until I decide, until I decide to walk away. I mean, or I guess maybe he does, but as far as I'm like, he's content, he's comfortable. Like, and as long as I'm letting him have what he wants, why would he change? So, and I, I told him on the day we got engaged, I was like, I actually cried a little bit because I was just like, I said, you just don't understand, like, how much it has hurt my feelings over the years to know that, because the first time that I did kind of say, if you're not willing to ever walk down this road, you're standing in the way of me having that in my life. And he's like, you're right. It's not fair. No fight for it. Like he was unwilling. And I understand from, he's had experience in his past that he wasn't willing to get pushed into a corner, but I didn't want him to push, be pushed into one. I wanted him to choose me. I wanted him to choose me on his own. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I was like, you just don't understand like how much it's hurt my feelings when, if I don't think about it daily, I think about it every week that you would rather lose me than live with me. Like that just, that hurts. I mean, not initially, it's not like, it's not like I was asking to move in after three months. Like it's been seven and a half years. I'm just like, that's, and he, you know, he, Malvin, <laughs> he hugged me. he's like, well, your feelings don't have to be hurt anymore. <laughs> but, I'm like, but I, but it's like, but I was, I was, I was all in, I was just, and I didn't, I was so all in on Andy. Like I didn't know how to, without any good reason to walk out. So I stayed and fortunately for me, it paid off. <laughs> I think that's exactly the same thing though, of all of the things that you've done, you are all in on your dreams. And I think that that is really the like a big testament to why you really like would probably say that you have a dream life because you've always gone all in. You've always made the decision that you're fully invested into this, a beautiful life that you've created. Yeah. I, I, I can't complain. I mean, I won't, I'm not gonna make that to me sound like I, like I work my butt off. So I work hours. Some people wouldn't want to for not even a ton of money, but I love my job and I love who I work with. And I love what I get to do because I know that I'm helping make an experience that has changed my life possible for other people. It's, it's in a very different way than from you, but it's just like, but it doesn't even, that does not even matter. The fact right. is you are so passionate about what you get to do. You love this company more than anything. Like this I is your passion. I love their mission. I love what they make possible. So it's like when I'm able to help the, create events or, or fix or find solutions for people to be able to utilize the same thing, it gives me joy. Even when that means like I'm pulling my hair out, like at the end of the day, when I resolve whatever's making me pull my hair out, I can say, okay, good. And it's not just a frustrated, okay, good. Now I finally get to walk away. Like, and I won't tell you that for the past two weeks, I had a glass of wine just about every night because (laughs) it's stressful. It's like the equivalent of our tax season right now. So it's busy and it's crazy, but it's like, but at the end of the day, I never wake up thinking, I don't want to go to work today. Like I'm, I, my work days are stressful because there's so many things I want to get done and there's not enough time. Yep. So it's time. 
It's always time. It's always time. Time is the biggest asset. But I do think that the reason why you have this life that you've created and you went all in on this beautiful life, it's not perfect. I mean, I love what I get to do. And some days, like, I am exhausted at the end of the days, too. I want to cry. We know. It's the rosé on ice days. Um, I just appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for being in my life. Thank you so much for bringing me joy. Thank you so much for inspiring me to always, you know, choose joy and do the things. And um, you make me laugh hysterically. I love you so much. You guys, please, 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 please go follow Leah because she does these fucking amazing <laughs> live skits on snacks. So we never got to go into it, but Leah is a global snack expert and she does live taste testings on her social media on her instagram um do you do them on really weird. People, people watch me eat people oh my god me- it's the best I, I literally like lives people do not stick around for lives i promise you you tune into one of leah's lives where she taste tests <laughs> snacks you're fucking bought in grab you some popcorn do not turn off that phone tell your kids to fucking be quiet because you want to be all in from start to finish when the taste test of the snack and if you happen. if anyone listening wants to send me snacks i oh will oh my have god please send snacks. her snacks yeah tell every no this is a damn truth i need to send you some canadian snacks like oh, oh i haven't done canadian snacks yeah send me all the um, maple things Yes, we need to send send Leah all the snacks. Leah, tell everyone where they can find you. Are you still doing your podcast? Well, not uh, not really. The podcast I was doing that you're talking about is on pause. I'm I have another pod coming. I think. <gasps> yeah, oh as with pod. Oh fuck! Well, I'm I don't know. So I mean, excited. if you're not into Zwift, I don't. People who are into Zwift will love it. Yeah, because, but will you just have some snacks? People, the two people that I, that I am podcasting with are way more famous than me. So I'm definitely like the, <laughs> the minion of the crew, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a guy named Rasan Bahati and, and Matt Stevens and anybody who's at all in the cycling world will be like, Oh, badass. Like they're, they're, they're awesome. So it should be oh good. Oh my God. I'm so excited for you. I didn't know this. When does it start? Uh, we've recorded one episode and it, based on what we talked about, it should have been out by now. So I don't know what's happening, but this should be soon. Oh my gosh. Okay. So tell everyone where they can find you. If you're into cycling, you know what, by the way, I have a new client who's huge into cycling. She does like triathlons, like these long distance mountain runs and all the things oh, I should really wow. hook you guys up. Yeah, definitely. Um, I yeah, love she, that. Yeah. She's badass just like you um okay i love you so much thank you for doing this please tell everyone where they can find you guys please 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 follow leah go check out her snack lives you're gonna regret it if you don't yeah i'm just i'm on instagram at at leah thorvalson that's and on facebook but i mean i'm i'm kind of like you like i don't instagram as much as you but if i do post it's there i have a twitter that's the same thing at leah thorvalson but i don't really tweet Yeah, but she's fun as fuck on Instagram and she's fun as fuck in real life. We need to do Rosé on Ice ASAP. I love you so, so much. Thank you you for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun.